drawing our hearts to you and to this church this day, that we might hear from you and we might give you glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you hear a little sort of scratchy noise, sounds like something's wrong with the sound system this morning. So try to just get past it like I'm trying to. <laughs> and let's just, let's just listen to God's Word. You know, I don't know if you know this or not, but in the United States, every four years, political promises are made. Had you noticed? Okay. Promises that some of the politicians will never ever be able to keep and ever intend to keep, but they're going to make the promises anyway, aren't they? They're going to increase our benefits. They're going to strengthen our military. They're going to cut out corruption. They're going to reduce and taxes. All right. Okay. Sometimes we have a hard believing those promises. Sometimes we're a little cynical, a little skeptical political promises will be fulfilled. Each year millions of brides and grooms are asked, will you live together in the covenant of marriage? Will you honor, love, comfort and keep each other in sickness and in health and forsaking all others? Be faithful to each other as long as you both shall live and with great sincerity of heart they say, I do. And yet, couples, their marriages end in painful divorce. Broken, fallen politics, we see it in marriages. Keep his promise. All the promises. to God's people very specific details about the coming Messiah. He gave these promises to the one this could be identified when he was born into this world and two, so we can look back and say yes, Jesus was the Christ. He is the Christ. Now from the New Testament, the Apostle Peter in his second letter refers back to the Old Testament prophecies. He said, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain. So the word of the prophets now is made more certain by looking back. And you, you believers, will do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place until it, the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. But above all, when he says above all, we sort of got to listen, right? Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So number one, you will do well to pay attention to the Old Testament prophets. Number two, the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus were not random thoughts from some ancient No, they were prophetic words, true promises of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Reading in Matthew, John the Baptist, who was in prison, his followers to ask, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Or should we be looking for somebody else? Are you the one? Did you notice how Jesus answered the question? He didn't say, no. He didn't say, yes. He said, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor Jews preach to them. That's my answer. Otherwise, what does fulfilled those, those prophecies. I fulfilled those promises of God. 
So, quoting Isaiah 5, which we heard this morning, years earlier, can you imagine 700 That Jesus was healing the blind, he was, he was making the lame walk, he was curing leprosy, he was healing the deaf, he was raising the dead. Try that. Have you seen many of those? One? Okay, no. I mean, he was raising the dead. He preached the good news to the poor of pocketbook and to the poor of spirit. So he clearly fulfilled these two Old Testament prophecies from Isaiah. Well, what about the other hundred or so prophecies about the Messiah from the Old Testament. Jesus didn't just fulfill a handful of them. He fulfilled them all. So this morning I'd like to share with you just five of the prophecies. One, the prophecy, the first prophecy about the coming Messiah. And these should be in your outline in the bulletin. Number two, the prophecy about the place of his birth. Number three, the prophecy about the miraculous nature of his birth. Number four, the prophecy about his specific ancestry, and number five, a prophecy about the manner of his death. So as we examine the scriptures, I believe it will become clear that Jesus is the prophesied, promised Messiah. So why? Why is it important for you to hear this this morning? Well, if you are not a believer, it may help prove to you that Jesus really is the prophesied Messiah, that he is the Christ. And if you are a believer, it may help you share Christ with others. So let's dive into it. Number one, the first recorded prophecy about the coming Messiah is found in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. God's plan from the beginning had all along been that he would have a face-to-face -face personal relationship with his people. Unfortunately, we have all rebelled against God. We have all hurt one another. We have all done those things of which we are ashamed. So even though we have all rebelled against God, God chose to bridge the gap between us and him. So immediately, not hundreds of years, not, you know, just immediately after the first man and woman rebelled against God, God announced immediately the coming Messiah, the one who had bridged the gap between God and man, the one who would pay the price for our salvation. So after Adam and Eve sinned against God, and after Adam blamed his wife, and after his wife Eve blamed the devil, God told Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Have any of you ever bruised your heel? It's hard to do, isn't it? I mean, you really have to stomp, 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 stomp for your heel to get bruised. And remember, the seed of the woman, the, 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 the seed of the woman would bruise the heel, would, would crush Satan's head by bruising his heel. So, so clearly, Satan will be defeated and yet, there'll be a, a, a mortal wound to this coming Messiah. If you saw Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion of the Christ, then you saw the opening scene where Jesus is fervently praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is praying to the point where it, he's, 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 he's sweating drops of blood. I mean, he is praying so fervently, and, and he's praying, and this is a part of his spiritual warfare as he's praying. Because Satan is whispering and, and trying to tempt him to turn away. And he knows his purpose. His purpose is the passion, his suffering, and his death on the cross for our forgiveness. So in his prayers, as he is, is battling within his soul and battling Satan, Satan smoothly and seductively tries to dissuade him from his passion purpose. And finally, a huge snake comes slithering out from under Satan's robe as, as he's whispering these seductive things to Jesus. And with fearless determination, Jesus looks at the snake and he stomps the serpent's head. This is a foreshadowing in Mel Gibson's movie 
of the prophecy from Genesis 3.15. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This scene foreshadows the cross of Christ. On the cross, Jesus allows himself to be tortured and killed. He allows Satan to bruise his heel, if you will. Satan had no, no idea that Jesus would have victory and rise from the dead. He had no clue. He had no idea that through the cross, Jesus would crush him and defeat him. He had no idea that Jesus would bridge the gap between God and man through the cross. At the end of the Passion of the Christ, the movie, when Jesus breathes his last and dies, all of a sudden you hear a scream. It's not Jesus. Do you know who it is? It's Satan. For all of a sudden he realizes, Oh no! I thought I was killing the Lord of glory. And now I've done myself in. Jesus has defeated me through his death on the cross. So Jesus is clearly, this, this prophecy of Jesus is fairly clearly fulfilled through Genesis 3.15. Now the Bible also foretells the place of his birth. 700 years before Jesus was born into this world, the prophet Micah proclaimed, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Now, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, though just barely. Joseph had settled in Nazareth. He had opened a carpentry business, and uh, he intended for he and his, his betrothed, Mary, to be there for the rest of their lives. And yet, the Roman census came along and forced them to go to Bethlehem, to his ancestral home. Jesus was born fulfilling the ancient prophecy. And the prophecy seems, though, to contain a paradox, doesn't it? It's an odd thing. It says that he would be born a human, yet his origins are from of old, from ancient times. Now, I've never seen a wrinkly old man being born. Have you? Anyone? Anyone seen an ancient baby? So this, 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 this person, this Messiah, will be ancient and a baby all at the same time. That's not normal. That's the incarnate Christ. That is the mystery of the incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas. That this person, a human, will be born of Mary. And yet he will be the Ancient of Days, whose origins are from of old. Now the Bible not only tells us the place of the Messiah's birth, but the miraculous nature of his birth. From Isaiah 7.14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. So the virgin will be with child, not by adoption, but she will actually give birth to the son and he will be called Emmanuel, God with us. So this passage makes two extraordinary claims. That the Messiah's mother will be a virgin. That she will not have had sexual relations with a man. And that the Messiah will be called Emmanuel, God with us. The person will also be divine at the same time. Now the New Testament book of Luke, in the first chapter, clearly tells us that Jesus fulfilled this ancient prophecy. Luke tells us the, that the archangel Gabriel came to visit Mary in Nazareth to tell her that she would be the mother of the Messiah. Mary asked Gabriel, how will this be since I am a virgin? Like, this isn't possible. And Gabriel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and the, one, uh, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So the one born will be Emmanuel, God with us, the Son of God, human yet divine at the same time, the mystery of the Incarnation. As the Apostle John said, from John chapter 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Emmanuel, the all-powerful Creator God, the one who spoke the creation into existence, will be with us in the flesh. 
Number four, even the Messiah's ancestry will be precisely foretold in Scripture. Now, 1,800 years before Christ was born into this world, 1,800, that's a long time. Before he was born into this world, the Holy Spirit inspired Jacob to say, the scepter will not depart from Judah. Otherwise, the, the, the messianic kingdom will come through the tribe of Judah, not the other 11 tribes of Israel, but through Judah. That would be like me predicting that the President of the United States in the year 3,819 will be born in Texas. You think I can do it? Think I can predict it? Will the United States even be around 1,800 years from now? I don't know. 1,800 years. That'd be like me saying, hey, he's going to be born in Texas. Now, 600 years before Christ was born into this world, the Holy Spirit inspired Jeremiah to say, the, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Have you known any kings or presidents named the Lord our righteousness? I had neither. No human being can take that title. So this messianic king will be born of the household of David and he will be called the Lord our righteousness. So now the field is narrowed even more. Not just the tribe, but the family. That would be sort of like me saying that the president, six, eight hundred, eighteen hundred years from now, will be born in Texas and his last name is going to be Smith. Unbelievable, right? Unless it's the promises of God, which are all true. And they would call him the Lord our righteousness. Human and yet divine. That's the mystery of the incarnation. Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. He was from the tribe of Judah. He was from the family of David. He was clearly divine. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. Number five. Not only were the tribe, family, origin, and miraculous nature of Jesus' birth foretold, but so was the manner of his death. Psalm 22, which was written a thousand years before Christ came into this world, was born into, uh, it says that, that Jesus' crucifixion, it defines Jesus' crucifixion with amazing details. Here, here, here's a couple verses from Psalm 22. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Sounds like the cross. All those Pharisees and Sadducees were gloating over him. They'd circled around. Next verse. They count all my bones. None of his bones were broken, remember? They broke the, the legs of the, the two on either side, but not his. He'd already died. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and they cast lots for my clothing. Remember that in the, in the Gospels? Then Isaiah 52 and 53 give even more detail about the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Now if I shared all the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, you'd be mad at me because we'd be here till supper time, okay? And that, that's how many prophecies there are. God's word is always true. His promises are always fulfilled. And God's greatest promise is the coming Messiah, the Messiah who came and will come again, the Christ the Savior of the world. So as you prepare for Christmas this year, know with confidence that the babe in the manger is indeed the prophesied Messiah, the one who was born for you, the one who died for you, the one who rose from the dead for you, the one who will return for you. There is no greater Christmas gift than the gift of Christ received. Amen. Let's stand 